a couple of places uh, in the brain where um, that would seem to contribute to chronic um, sort of set points for arousal. So, uh, but they would, they would, not that I've looked, they would seem to sit in a while. Um, they used to focus a lot on the reticular activating system, which is kind of like just above the spine, as the spine comes into the brain. Yeah, as, a, as a source of arousal, and in more recent years, there's been a lot more attention to the amygdala. Um, well, it's actually sometimes gets described as the seat of all emotion. I think it's probably much more accurate if they go to the seat of arousal. <coughs> Talk more next week about what, what might be different about that. Um, but certainly, you know, you see, you see differences between individuals that correspond to chronic arousal levels, particularly chronic negative arousals, so like fear and anger, are particularly related to uh, amygdala uh, activity in imaging research now. People used to, like, maybe still do, as I say, it's just not something people used to like, do things to rats, particular activating systems, and create different kinds of arousal patterns. This is actually another way of thinking about how we'll, we'll talk about this more next week once we talk about emotion, but another way of thinking about what neuroticism means is that um, chronic high arousal, they just kind of give you a set point where additional emotional response feels actually worse than it does for somebody who's, who's lower, who has a lower set point for chronic arousal. And in fact, people with very low arousal levels might might be the kind of people that are always looking for uh, arousal. So like you, you, you clearly have people who find things fun and exciting that other people find terrifying. <laughs> and and there's, there's a whole interesting set of questions around whether that is a kind of like biologically imperative trait-like thing or or whether people just sort of learn this along the lines. I mean, somehow, you know, as you're being dragged around fairgrounds or through Magic Mountain as a kid, that you know, somebody either tells you that you know, being dropped from a big height very fast is really, really fun, or they tell you it's really, really scary. <laughs> I mean, and tell you might mean explicitly. I, mean, I think some parents do tell their kids in so many words. And other parents can convey these things by their own reactions. I mean, and so you can get these whole, as there is everywhere else, all sort of nature nurture kind of question. I mean, the, you know, is it imperative because you're like your parents, or you know, are you afraid of it because your parents were afraid of it? And pick it up very um, I certainly have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> There's kind of a range of answers to the question that you ask. Oh, you're just scratching your head. Oh, see? <laughs> 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 uh, Maria was behind you doing the same thing. Um, so, uh, implications for programs and policy. Uh, you know, one thing, I think stated this way, sounds really simple minded. When you got in the world, you think that people do sort of think and act like old people are all the same on some of these dimensions. Um, when I was out doing a lot of community consultation work and assessments in the community, one of the things I was doing for a while was uh, responding to requests from people at, uh, usually in senior housing buildings, independent living, senior housing, subsidized housing in the hood, where, um, like a lot of social programs, people are, are supposed to be encouraging social activity. Because at least back in the 60s and 70s, when a lot of these laws were passed, apparently Congress people were convinced that older adults were socially isolated and lonely, and so it's not enough to like house people and give them food. You have to make sure that they get more social activity. Uh, and sometimes I mean, we really found you know, like psychological problems. That, you know, it turned out that somebody was depressed or they were agoraphobic. Or, something else was going on that's psychological. But a lot of the times, you know, what the people would tell me, as far as I could tell them, in interviewing them and assessing them seemed to be entirely true, is that they were introverted. They'd been introverted all their life. They didn't want to hang out with other people. 
the fact that they moved into that house and didn't really change this. And actually, sometimes you also found out that people had active social lives, they just didn't happen to have it with people that lived in the building. <laughs> but the poor um, manager of the building, you know, had these reports to fill out and say how many people they were getting to come down and socialize. So, yeah, so I think you're know, really just keeping in mind that people um, are highly variable on things like introversion, extroversion, and, and um, introverted old people are quite likely introverted younger people. Um, and may be quite happy being there. Um, and they may not, and you, and you, need, to, you need to think about those differences. Um, so, you know, again, just expanding on that second point, we do have these rules and regulations that kind of encourage socialization for everybody. Um, Cost and McRae, uh, in the height of their uh, correlational stability advocacy days, and this is still you know, one of the things that a lot of people um, would go from the correlational stability of personality uh, to argue against the idea of, any, of a I'm trying to think there's a different way to say this. Head this up. Almost every time I say this, there's at least two or three people in the audience that have had, you know, like a, a father or an uncle or somebody who had a midlife crisis and ran off with a younger girlfriend and bought a red convertible. Um, it clearly does happen, but uh, the fact that there doesn't seem to be any marked upward change in neuroticism around middle age for men or for women for that matter, would seem to argue against the idea that there's like a developmental stage of midlife crisis. Um, what in fact Costin McCray would say was that people who are the guys who do this are probably guys who were always high on neuroticism. And so they were, you know, on some level, uh, high on neg trait negative effect all this time and something social, financial, whatever circumstances change in midlife so that they're not capable of acting out on their, on their crisis. When they get tired of following their rules. Hmm? Or they, they mm. just get tired of following the rules or whatever. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's probably a very small but dramatic set of people <laughs> that, you know, this whole idea of a, of a midlife developmental stage. Just in general, stage theories have not done well empirically. People find them really, really appealing. And if you go back and read some of the original stuff, like most of them were based on either clinical experience are very, very small samples of men and mostly professional upper management sort of men. So there used to be this book that guided a lot of thinking about adult personality and stage theory called A Season of a Man's Life. And that's what it was. It was based on about 25 guys or something. And it was all guys. <clears throat> and it has been a problem until fairly recently, even a lot of the um, Samples that we've been talking about today, many of them started off as, as mostly to entirely male, and then they've added women in as the decades have gone by. It became untenable to study men and gender lives to everybody. Especially when you know, gerontologists fairly quickly pointed out that in fact most old people are women. So. <laughs> they should just generalize to other men and leave us women out. <laughs> Another way to go. Yeah. Uh, and I already talked about the hypochondria thing. Actually, just a little. One of my early lessons in talking to the press, you know, and, and this, this kind of thing, you know, you, you'll get these kind of calls as you get into your professional careers in gerontology. And one of the things that you, um, all of us, ought to learn the hard way. Um, is that there's often a, quite a difference between what you thought you said and what ends up in print. <laughs> um, and I had a guy who actually was before him, after this, a fairly good friend of mine at the time. He was a reporter on a local paper and he came and interviewed me about personality and, and aging and um, I went over this stuff about Costa McRae and the 